Welcome to Opera Holland Park, just in the process of setting up for their annual summer season. And we're delighted to say we're going to be here with a special word in your park on June the 18th to celebrate the 80th birthday of James Paul McCartney in the company of Danny Baker, Julia Rayside, Andy Miller, Jeff Lloyd and Graham Goldman in this fabulous arena which has the combination of a roof that keeps the rain off but sides that allow the sunlight and the air in. If you came last year, you won't need reminding. If you didn't come last year, make sure you come this year. Okay, welcome to another word in your ear. We've often discussed on uh, on this uh, vidcast and podcasts how... Um, how, and nothing carries you back to a distant time more swiftly and more powerfully than old magazines or newspapers of the time, which won't be won't happen in the future. Uh, our guest, Mark Patrick's new book, Glam, When Superstars Rocked the World, this isn't just a narrative of that particular time, uh, but it's also a treasure trove of uh, clippings from the pop press uh, of uh, advertisements from the music press that bring the whole thing back in a kind of mad Proustian rush. An ancient dog-eared fan club cards that you simply can't get enough of. So, Mark, tell us about this. How, mm. did, they, how did this start? Has this been a long-term labour of love? You've obviously hung on to all this stuff for many years. Tell us about it. Yeah, well, I mean, some of the stuff, actually, we, we did, we put a call out to fans and they, you know, there's a lot of very keen uh, glam uh, fans, especially, you know, I mean, glam, we used glam really as a catch-all, but it really was the age of superstars. That's why I wanted the word superstar in the title. But yeah, I mean, I grew up in that time um, and I still have the collection of music scenes and, and various things like that. Uh then professionally, I wrote the, the first book I did really was the, the Bolan one. I've written a couple on Bowie. Over the years, I've invent, uh, interviewed so many of the characters from that time. And I thought that there needs to be, there are a few land books out there, but one that told the story in kind of page turning fashion, because it was a very fast moving time then. Uh, and also illustrated because really it was such a visual era as well. So it needed it. And so Omnibus, they kind of devised the format and, and hey presto, we were off with it. And you were there at the time, weren't you? I mean, how old were you when it all took off? Well, um, I was tw uh, I was 13 in 1972. Perfect. So uh, my first gig was family, actually. Uh, yeah, because right. I, I love burlesque. I thought I'd never heard a song like this in my life before. Uh, and he had a bit of that Bolanesque warble in his voice, Roger yeah. Chapman. Um, but I didn't, I mean, when I, I did see some glam gigs, but mainly it was experienced, like most other people, through Top of the Pops. It was a living room, small screen phenomenon in many ways. Um, I saw Roxy with Eno. I was just uh, 14 then. And that was phenomenal. I mean, uh, you know, we were just little kids with the uh, first pack of uh, consulate cigarettes I remember taking to that thing. <laughs> and there was the girls in the row in front of us, all with these like Hollywood kind of glamour about them and I thought my god we really entered the adult world and uh, it was great so you didn't see too much of Eno he was hidden behind all this equipment which was a shame but phenomenal and and Brian Ferry in those days was an extremely strange creature on stage very very unusual I mean we think of him as almost like a pop prince Philip now but uh, <laughs> back in those days, he was uh, there was no one like like Ferry at all with his rictus grin and yeah. he, he, he didn't quite understand where clothes. he came. Extraordinary, really was. Uh, you know, people think about Eno as the innovator, but I think Ferry and he wrote a lot of those songs. Uh, fabulous stuff, underrated in those days. You know, he's a little softer these days. You so your your period of time you're dealing with here is, is 1970 to 1974. Uh -huh. So what makes you identify about that particular period of time? How, how does it start and how does it finish? Well, what I did, I of course I have my memories of, of the time, but I went back to the press because we've all got ideas of what glam is. And it can be anything from Noel Coward and Josephine Baker to Lady Gaga and, uh, you know, Melania Trump or whatever, you know, it's, it's just, it's become absurd in a way. Um, so I wanted to take it back to its original, 
yeah, meaning and the, and the original period, as I say, the superstar period, really. 1970, because that was the moment when you had the kind of death of hippie, the death of idealism. And we did, you know, something. There was a vacuum there, a vacuum particularly in pop, which bubblegum filled uh, to start with. Uh, the Beatles disappeared as well. And then Boland was the one who put the makeup under his eyes, uh, spring 71, hot love, and, and set the whole thing going. 74, I chose as the ending because in 73, you had um, Bowie calling a day on Ziggy. You had Don Powell with the accident with Slade. All oh, right. Um, and then, you know, you had Alice, Rod Stewart falling apart from their bands. You know, these, these bands were teens. They were old mates for, for going back years and the stars were being removed. There was a lot of um, disturbance, I would say, by that time. Sweet were moving away from uh, Chin and Chapman. And they were all, none of them called themselves glam. They all hated the phrase glam. And glam only really emerged in about autumn 72 as a phrase in the press. Oh, did it really? I was going to ask you that question. Because, mm. So when, when, did, did, they they first when did it first appear? 1972, that expression? I, yes, I started to see it in the old pages of Pop Press around autumn 72. Oh, Before really? then, you had Glitter Rock, yes. uh, which was associated with Boland and a little bit with Gary Glitter in the summer of 72. Before that, it was Boland's cosmic rock. I mean, that was his idea. Oh, really? Of oh, wow. Yes, of course. Cosmic <laughs> rock. Because he still wanted to hang on to his rock audience to start with, Boland. So 1971, he, he hadn't gone full glam. I mean, he was a very glamorous pop star, but he was almost positioning himself as a new Beatles, you know, an album artist and a singles artist. Yeah, no, sure, sure. And so it was, it was very, very confusing fun. communication, wasn't it, with, with T-Rex? Because to... to the 13 year olds, he had no past life, really, did he? He, he kind no. of appeared. Mm. Whereas to people like me and Mark, I was this guy who'd been, been squatting on carpets for years. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, there's, a, there's a lovely bit where he meets the, the Tony Visconti in your book and he arrives and actually brings a Persian rug with him, doesn't he? Which he unrolls yeah. and to sit on. So, I know. And there's a, in America, the pre, there was a press release, I think I found, Blue Thumb from 1969, and they said, well, Mark Bowden, you know, who, who lived in a tree? Yes, you know, that's right. That, that kind of um, yeah. vibe about him. And he wasn't even trusted, really, by the rock, the mainstream rock press, in a way. He was seen... Oh, not, 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 not at all. Not at all. Not at all. I mean, you know, it, it was John, John Peel's kind of... Uh, you know, denial of him is kind of a, it, it, what happened to an entire generation as far as Mark Boland was concerned. You know, it was a kind yeah. of, it was a sellout. Yeah, well, I was right. at the Mealy Festival when he came on the headline after they'd been, you know, after they were T-Rex, basically, and all these hippies who'd come to see the faces and stuff just threw bottles at him. I mean, it was just, they were horrified. felt he'd just completely sold out. But yeah. uh, would you say that Ryder White Swan is the first uh, official, officially first glam record because you talk about that being played by Ted uh, Jeff Dexter I think it is at the, at yes. the Isle of Wight Festival who was the DJ and that really yeah. launched it would that be the first it, well it did launch something I don't know if you really would call it glam but yeah um it's sort of in that pre-glam period yeah but it was certainly the song that brought Boland to prominence and suddenly you had you know, the stirrings of T-Rex to see you know the, the girls at the backstage door yeah. Kind of different. They were fourteen instead of nineteen-year-old hippie girls. Yeah. And um, but Boland, once he got that bit between his teeth with that hit, which was I think a number two, he wrote "Hot Love," which was just classic kind of pop song. He was there to stay. But Ryder White Swan wasn't going to be a one-hit wonder for him. You know, he he had the you know he, he had what he wanted. You know, he was always a rock and roller, really. Right. Uh, so, and, would and you describe really, glam? Would you describe glam as a, a uniquely British phenomenon? Mm. It didn't travel well to the States. It was, um, they didn't trust characters in the States. I mean, the, what, what broke through in a sort of a glam way in the States was Kiss. And they yeah. didn't do it by presenting themselves. They did it as presenting them as, as cartoon characters. Whereas in Britain, we were, we were, more secure about our sexuality or our theatricality <laughs> to, so that we could we could get away with this kind of thing. And there's a lovely quote I remember, it's not in the book, but Mick Jagger said, if you get a group of blokes at a party together, by the end of the evening, you know they're all going to be up in the girlfriend's wardrobe trying all the clothes on. Right. You know, he said it was a kind of a peculiarly British... British thing. 
Yeah. Um, you know, the pantomime dame and all that. It's so, carry on films, isn't it? And all that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, very, that, I mean, that kind of humor was also so prominent at the time. Um, the carry on, you know, the on the buses, are you being served? Uh, yes. Larry <laughs> but also, didn't it need a, I mean, it could never have happened in America, I think. It's simply too big. The thing about England is, or Britain is, it's so small comparatively, mm. and it's got a national press. And it struck me looking at the book that so much of the success of Clam was about the way people looked and the way they appeared in national newspapers. That was a big part of it, wasn't it? It was. I mean, the look was was so important. Um, you know, and all kind of characters ended up clamming up. You had straws wearing makeup on top yes. of the pot. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> they didn't look too good with it. No. Uh, I mean, even before Glam, you had Jagger and you had characters. I mean, Jagger was the one that they all took the, the lead from, you know, Rod Stewart with the pink silk suit that Jagger had. Yeah. Uh, David Bowie did, you know, Anything that you know, Bowie, you know, by seventy three, he was doing his Stones pastiches, and he really a performance. The film performance was very important as well, you know, in that the whole gender blur thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, the the theatre side of, of things, but you know, in some ways, that obscures what I wanted to do in the book was really give the artists their due, and you know, uh, so it's the glam thing is a bit of a put on the side, and and you, you've got. 15, 16 different artist stories running along side by side and um, t giving it back to the artists, really, because that was really what it was about. When People didn't say I was a glam rock fan in 72, 73. They said that I was a, a David fan, a Mark fan, right. a rock fan. Yes, yeah, yeah. And there was a magazine called Superstar at the time, and it was really, you know, we had rock superstars before, Hendrix, Janice, uh, Jim Morrison, and this was the era of the pop superstar. It was something, so, you know... So so we talked about the derivation, that, you know, when the term glam appeared. When did mm. the term superstar appear? Is that Jesus Christ superstar and and the and the Carpenters hit? Mm. The Leon it, Russell song. It, is that <laughs> when it kind of starts? Really, it's so that's well, what 1969. No. Yeah, I mean, already you had uh, Hendrix and Joplin. Uh, you know, mentioned in Time and Life magazine as, as rock superstars. Oh, really? Did you? Know, okay. Paul, they were like the new Beethoven, you know, the, the, the high quality grade A rock stars. Yeah. But I traced it back to really Warhol, Andy Warhol and his oh, factory superstars. Yeah. 1965, Edie Cedric was the main one. And it was kind of an used in a sort of an ironic way, in a democratic way. It was like uh, an ironic take on old Hollywood, you know, so we'll have some, uh, you know, well, one of his crazy characters who's hanging around the factory, we're going to designate that person as a superstar, you know, and uh, to hell with anything else. So anyone can be a superstar. And that was a Warhol by uh, 15 minutes of fame thing yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the thing about the early 70s was that it transferred into the pop world. It wasn't just a rock thing, uh, a rock god. It was a pop, pop superstar. You've got loads of wonderful pictures throughout this book, and some of my favourite ones are the, are, are the pictures of the fans, because that yeah. is purely one of the defining elements of this whole thing, because it didn't happen in the 60s. People didn't dress up like the Rolling mm. Stones or whatever, because you couldn't do, whereas mm. T-Rex and Sweet and Roxy Music, whatever, you dressed up to identify yourself with them, didn't you? I mean, that was a really powerful thing, wasn't it? Tell us about that. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was this spirit, perhaps, of individualism in the 70s, where 60s perhaps was more of a collective spirit. The whole youth is kind of moving sort of together, growing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the 70s, it went back to individualism, the old-fashioned idea of the star, the Tommy Steele, the, the, the Hedy Lamar from Hollywood. Um, uh, someone you look up to, and I think they, you know, in the 30s and 40s, women used to em emulate Ginger Rogers and Barbara Stanwyck and characters like that. Uh, so, yes, the identification with the individual stars, and which is why you used to have the playground wars. You know, I was a T-Rex fan, so on the school bus, I would be attacked by slave fans. You know, have big bundles on the bus. <laughs> and there was a kind of that rivalry, and you, yeah, you, you, you dressed more in the map. I had curly hair as well, long curly hair like like Bowden. So you you did want to look like your your star. It was it was a phenomenon of that time and, and Bowie uh, fans particularly, you know, took that to the nth degree, you know. He's the commander and I'm the space cadet, that quote from the uh, arena documentary.
There's Apparently. two absolutely extraordinary pictures. One of uh, a, a double page spread of Slade fans, another one of David Cassidy fans. And it struck me that uh, are you are you going to post those and see if you can get anybody who appears in those pictures to to get Ooh. in touch? Because it just would be a really interesting, uh, interesting publicity thing, but from anything else. Absolutely great idea. Do you know, I hadn't thought of that. And uh, I think, yeah, I, I can't remember which photo agencies they came from, but we might need to double check with them. But uh, it would be great if they came through. But as I said, you know, in some of that memorabilia has come from fans, um, yeah. including some priceless pictures that taken of Boland, you know, two or three days before he died outside his office in uh, um, Bond, New Bond Street. Right. So, uh, yeah, fans at gigs and that sort of thing. I mean, it was a very much a fans thing, uh, a glam, you know. And as I say, it was lived out in the in the living rooms, really, and in your bedrooms with your record player and bedrooms full of posters. I wish I still had photographs of my glam era bedroom. It would have been full of Melanie and uh, Mark Boland posters. <laughs> and James Bond. <laughs> yeah, because this it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because this is kind of it's essentially British pop music, isn't it? Because it. That didn't mm. happen in the 60s because you didn't really have it. Top of the Box wasn't that big a thing in the 1960s. It became a huge mm. thing in the 1970s. And it was that whole yeah. notion of the whole family sits around and watches one television. Mm. And, and half the point of the program is to offend the adults, yeah. isn't it? It's, a, yeah. it's your, your bringing the war into your, into your living room. And that was, yeah. you know, that was the period when people all got around one telly. Whereas I remember going forward a bit when Mark and I were working on smash hits and so forth. I remember seeing a reader survey in the early eighties that said that a huge proportion of them, a huge percentage of them had the, a television in their bedroom because they had the old family television in their bedroom mm. when the mm. family had got the new one. Yeah. And that seemed to me a huge sea change because you were yeah. no longer watching with your mum and dad or your grandparents or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That was Definitely. the eighties, and you didn't. One of the, I, I, I agree because I think in the in the seventies you had to fiercely defend the groups you liked because you had mm. to do so in the living room against your own parents, and so a yeah. part of the reason people had such intense loyalty, I think, is that they had to fight, <laughs> had to fight to, to, to defend them. Yeah, and also, of course, that the, they all dressed up then um, because the, the advent of colour TV, people were getting more colour TVs at that stage. So um, Sweden and the, the whole lot of them just played up to that, you know. With the, so you've got the, the, the shiny sparkle, you've got the colours and the, the vamping up to the camera, you know. Um, yeah, that was a, a, by, by 75, I think, colour TV eclipsed black and white, which is actually... Later than I'd imagine. It, is, yeah, it takes yeah. a long time to do it. it takes a long time yeah. to happen. Do you think it's surprising when you look back on that era and there's so much talk about androgyny and you know and gender mm. bending and all that kind of thing? Mm. Yeah, there were still hardly any out gay pop stars. Is that right? Is that the case? It... That is the case. I mean, Bowie spoke um, you know, a very well about gay culture and brought it on board and um you know and he sort of you know is he isn't he that that added to the flavor of everything as well but you know um uh the gay lib magazine gay news started in the summer of 72 i think just when ziggy was coming out and they adopted bowie as you know i think one enthusiastic writer said you know he is going to lead us, you know, he's going to be 15,000 of us at the gig at Earl's Court in 73, you know, it's very ambitious, but uh, he was seen as the, 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 the man leading the charge um, at all this. So yes, it was a hugely um, influential in terms of so many pop artists of the eighties who were gay came, were encouraged and inspired by, um, you know, hanging around the offices of, T-Rex waiting for the T C Mark Boland. I mean, that whole period just uh, opened up something that a seam about sexuality that was really kind of hidden in, in pop. But what wasn't hidden, as you say, was the androgyny, the androgynous look, the unisex was really very much a hippie thing and a middle class thing in the in the late 60s. Right. But 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 glam, glam brought that into the, you know, right out into the open so that everyone could all partake, partake in that. And there was, 
you know, think pieces in the in the, the broad seats saying, you know, well, this is we're moving towards bisexuality. The future is it's sex, gender isn't going to matter. It's good, you know, beyond gay thinking, it's just like it doesn't really matter. You know, this is the bisexual future. And there was a lot of, you know, psychologists and things talking about this. It's a real, all the boundaries are still coming down. So in some ways, it was a continuation of 66, 67 mm-hmm. um, in that respect, I would say. So who are the artists that you you, you think don't are, are, are not, uh, not as celebrated as, as they ought to be? Well, I mean, Bowie is extremely, so Bowie is up there with the with the Beatles now. Boland still doesn't quite get his due, I don't think. Um, he wasn't always his best advert because he alienated journalists in a way, you know. I'm, you know, I'm Mr. Bowland, I'm selling 50,000 a week and all that kind of stuff. We, really he wasn't particularly him. warm and characterful and funny and engaging mm-hmm. like Bowie was. I mean, he was, he was a bit well, arrogant. That's right. He distant. was more really sit, took it took it all very seriously and yeah. the fame kind of did go to his head and he didn't really know how to play journalists and get them on his side i mean he was a very he was a sensitive and a very kind of a lovely guy by many accounts but he always had to show off a bit in the press whereas bowie his dad was a pr man bowie knew how to shake hands how to pre- press the flesh and how yeah. to treat treat journalists and also bowie was well read literate uh, he could discuss various other things with, with Charles Murray's and the Nick Kents of the world. Boland really could discuss Boland. Yes, <laughs> and, that's true. Yeah, that, you know, that, that was a kind of a, a difference there. But Boland, you know, to give him his credit, he he, he wrote, you know, he channeled some, who could do a song like Cosmic Dancer? I mean, it no, just landed a, yeah, yeah. in his lap, but it's extraordinary. And um, Bowie always was admiring of, of Boland in that respect. He knew he was someone special, that he couldn't quite be, but Bowie had many other strings to his bow, you know, whereas Boland really was more of You see, I, and I, my personal theory on the tragedy of Mark Boland is <laughs> he was fabulously beautiful for a very short period of time and that he wasn't mm. beautiful anymore. And so much of Mark Boland's appeal was he was beautiful. Yes. David Bowie, um, never quite the same. It didn't no. matter in the same way. Mark Nolan was a pinup. He was David Essex as well as everything else. Yeah. And then mm. and then it kind of went off really quickly. It struck me. And, yes. Uh, and he uh, yeah. didn't change. You couldn't imagine a 35-year-old Mark Bowler. No, w- when he stopped being the kind mm. of elfin pixie character, he, he was mm. no longer really Mark Bowler, I think. That was half the problem. Yeah, yeah. No. Oh, I know. And it also, because he was... Yeah, judged so much by his beautiful appearance and also yeah. his psychic Mickey Finn. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was yeah, quite. Hard, hard for for the fans to really think about the, the musical to get the musical side of him through, you know. And he really struggled with that. He wanted to be taken seriously because he was a big soul man. He was, uh, you know, listening to soul all his life, like David Bowie was. No, no, sure. Um, sure. Um, the one person who struck me as being possibly a little underrated, I don't know what you think, was was Susie Quattro, because had there been no Susie Quattro, the, 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 the possibly couldn't wouldn't have been a Runaways, there might not have been a Joan Jett, and, and, and to some extent a Chrissy Hind, and and maybe there was a connection right through to Madonna. Do you mm. think she's? Uh, do you think she was a, a, a more significant uh, part of it all than, than than she's given credit for? Well, I think she does get credit these days from you know uh, women performers. Um, but you're right, at the time, I think she was seen, you know, she was seen as novel. I mean, they're all seen as novelties in a way, and Susie, yeah. perhaps even more so. Uh, actually, interestingly enough, she said to me, I, I never regarded myself as a glam rocker at all. I was a rock and roller. You know, that yeah. was her, her take on things. But yeah, extraordinarily important, because obviously, you know, teenage boys found her uh, fascinating to see yeah. this you know, kind of um, tomboyish kind of character, really, on stage. And uh, yeah, for young girls you know, to see someone with a bass guitar giving it that rock and roll kind of thing, you know. Th- I mean, there was bands like Fanny doing it uh, in the in the rock world, but you know, you had to read Melody Maker or an NME to know really about yeah. a band like that. And you know, there was always singers or acoustic. It, it, you know, the Jonies with the acoustic guitar and the Melanies, uh, Janis Joplin out front, but no one who was there out front as a real out and out rock and roller. So very inspiring on Joe Jet. 
punk acts as well. I mean, there she was all in leather as well. You know, yeah. Yeah. punk. So, Mickey Most Mickey Most said to her, I think uh, you can't wear leather. It's too old fashioned. He felt uh, it was. Well, cool. it would be for him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose that indicated lots of things were coming back round, weren't they? Um, the so what were the media that that uh, you know focused on that area? You know, are we talking about TV programs like Supersonic and things like that? Is that Supersonic? Yeah, that came really perhaps at the the dregs of glam period. Oh, did it? Know, okay. uh, well, it it was yes. I mean, as I say, the book stops in seventy four because I wanted to stop it when the superstar thing kind of crumbled or you know but some of the lower the more ordinary glam act sort of continued a bit but really it was pop spot and music scene were two of the magazines that catered um to glam and they were color magazines um uh, essentially and they emerged in autumn 72 which was really it really was getting into motion by then that time so so much of it is is just about color isn't it both on television and in print. Yeah, absolutely. The colour the color is very important. Um, and they all played up to that. But as I said, psychedelia was very colourful. And then afterwards, actually, everything went very utilitarian. The Isle of Wight, it would be jeans and T-shirt, jeans and T-shirt, you know. Yeah. Uh, Paul Rogers, Rory Gallagher, that kind of yeah. thing. Um, yeah. What the feminists in the early 70s called cock rock, you know, the cock rockers. Right, no, sure. Um, and glam brought something different. It brought back the, the idea of the dandy, the feminized, the, the androgynous look, and uh, it, suddenly it warmed all that up again, but it gave it to a much wider audience, you know, 15 million on watching Top of the Pops every week. That's which didn't press. really work in the music press, did it? I mean, the black and white music press, that's one of the reasons that they just didn't get behind it, because they just didn't... So those, no. those, those stars just didn't come across on, in, in black and white photographs. No, but they were fascinated by it. And of course, they really did get behind Bowie, which got uh, yeah. Boland back a bit, you know, because they, they felt that Bowie really, you know, was kind of one of them in a way. Uh, and he was genuinely bringing something new, the spirit of camp and irony, which, right. you know, the old idea of the sincere rock artist, the sincere singer-songwriter, the sincere prog, you know, would-be Beethoven's. And Bowie was saying... No, we can be bigger than that. You know, it's yeah. just a bit of a philistine, just to have a bit, you know, look at irony, look at the shadows, look at the contradictions. And that's what Bowie brought to uh, pop. And it was enormous, absolutely enormous. There's right. so many good details in the book. There's one lovely one you talk about the, the Mott the Hoople fan club. And I think Benazir Bhutto was absolutely. a member. Doesn't she turn up? Chris Needs, I think, was running the fan club age 19 or something. I think she turned up at the fan club. I just yeah, love well. the idea. And yeah, again, it was so universal. Everybody loved it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a fantastic story from Chris, who was you know, just a couple of years older than me, and he was in the thick of it, you know, living in Aylesbury, which was always a great... Yeah, If yeah. you're playing outside London, you go to Aylesbury, and very big for Bowie. He saw Bowie before the glam period and, of course, afterwards, and, um, you know, it, it, enormous change. Yeah. I, it's wonderful how the, um, the, the bits of ephemera bring, as I said at the beginning bring it all back in a way that nothing else does. I'm just looking yeah. in front in front of me. You've got a ticket for David Bowie at the Rainbow, where he was supported by Roxy Music, which, of course, we all remember, but also Lloyd Watson. Who yeah. remembers Lloyd? I mean, who was I, Lloyd Watson? I have not thought about Lloyd Watson for 50 I think years. I've ever heard of him. I have heard yeah. of Lloyd Watson. He was just a rather some solemn singer-songwriter, as far as I know. Mm-hmm. He, he was... Everybody talked about he was going to happen, and then he didn't. He must have been managed by somebody connected with David Bowie or Roxy Music or something. Well, I go on. My memory, my memory is that he won a competition. Yes, I think he probably did. Melody Um, Maker, Rock and Folk, or something like that. that. Exactly that kind of thing, David. Yeah, yeah. I think that's where he came from. But But uh, yes, it's the idea (laughs) in the midst of. You know, glam yeah. is suddenly a guy with a check shirt. You know, because yeah, yeah, and that's the kind of thing that you don't get when you get a kind of retrospective documentary about this stuff. You know, no, absolutely you, not. You don't get the flavour. I was very pleased to see. I think you did it. You did a list here of the twenty. Uh, do you twenty great songs, twenty great records from mm. that period, and you include Gary Glitter, which say, I mean, I don't know if your publisher said, "Oh, I don't think you should do that," but he, he is. He's obviously been written out of history. 
Gary Lineker was a very big deal, wasn't it? Huge deal. Absolutely massive deal. And you couldn't write him out, you know. Um, you know, I'm a historian, a pop historian, but a historian. And you have to, you know, if you're going back to the, the facts and getting the story right, um, I don't think anyone would thank me for, for you know, writing him out. But the interesting twist on that story is a lot of the genius of that glitter sound, well, nearly all of the genius of it, was created by Mike Leander. The Absolutely, old yeah. 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 And, you know, Leander had a great pair of ears. He'd worked with the Stones. He'd worked with Billy Fury and... Um, the Beatles. The Beatles. He was yeah. leaving home, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. He was listening. Yeah. In the early 70s, he heard the, the, the development of rhythm in pop. You know, you had um, the Burundi Black single. Yes. You had, yeah. He's going uh, to step on you again, John Congas. Yes. And he realised that there's something here in this. So, you know, originally they started to... Um, the idea was that it would... No, they, they wanted to kind of mimic this kind of African sound. Yeah, and in yeah. the end... When they got the jam down on tape, they said, well, no, it's like a weird twist on, on rock and roll music. And it just came sort of almost by accident in a way. But the way he produced it with those wheezing saxes and guitar sounds, I love it. And then the twin, the twin drums. The twin, twin drums, drums, I know, absolutely. That's, that's just probably his idea, idea, was it? Yeah. It's like, yeah, I mean, he really, and he knew that the Mr. G was a good front man who could carry and project that. Yeah. And, you know, at the time he did. But um, yeah, but also that sound is presumably it was presumably a beneficiary of the fact that people were beginning to hear pop music in their village hall or the school hall or whatever played louder, weren't they, on record? You know, you're yeah. beginning to get the disco, yeah. aren't you? Even though it wasn't probably wasn't called, it wasn't disco as a as an aesthetic, well, but it was. No. That's how disco you heard things. Yeah, discotheques and youth clubs. Yeah. Often the stuff was at youth, so you, the Slade went down very well uh, at youth clubs. And, uh, yeah, also the equipment was getting loud. You know, it, 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 yeah, yeah, it's really important. Yeah. People were, yeah, just... Um, so the days of turning up with an AC-30 like the Stones did and that and playing to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Five people were gone. But more, more to the point, I mean, like parties. I, we were talking about this, I can't remember what context. You know, if you had a teenage party in the 60s, it was in your home. Well, the loudest thing you had was a dance set. It wasn't capable of getting very loud at all. It? No, that's right. It, it, couldn't, um, it couldn't drown out conversation. Whereas in the 70s, you start to get that kind of thing, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I remember I got my first bedroom stereo myself with separate speakers, and it was from the second edition of Music Scene. Fred Della, the late, uh, the much-missed Fred right. Della, he had a column writing about um, equipment. Hi-fi, did he? <laughs> really? Hi-fi. And right. so I said to Fred years later, you, it was your you the glowing <laughs> review. Yeah. Gave, but I had a mate who had floor speakers. And that what a difference that was. Oh, Proper God, yeah, floor. rumbled through the floor. <laughs> yeah. And that was just amazing. Yeah, and it, it made such a difference that, you know, when you had equipment, it, it was very much an equipment period. People would talk about cassettes, eight tracks, you know, all yes. that was running along. Alongside yeah. the period, yeah. but clap didn't work at low volume, really, did it? I mean, no. that, that was the whole. No, point definitely it, not to no, be no. stomping and loud. It was public music, and, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, football terraces picked up a lot of the glam song. Well, it was a symbiotic relationship, I think. Slade made records that completely feel to that. And you had chicory something about the haircuts, the clothes, and everything. The whole culture. The two things were really interlocked. I think. Yeah. And I think the fans of most clubs took Son of My Father and uh, adopted it to their favourite striker. So you had uh, Rodney, 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 Marsh, yeah. son, you know, yeah. Rodney, yeah. Uh, you know, to the tune. And that I wish I had recordings of that. I mean, I used to be on the terraces myself then. and I love that. The sound of fans singing on a football terrace. There's that old clip of the Beatles. Uh, she Loves You on at the Cop. It's brilliant from the 60s. I've yeah. not seen anything from the 70s uh, like that. Yeah. So who, who's the artist who you think should, uh, you know, should be rediscovered from this period? Who's it, or has it all just been picked over, you know, by everybody? Oh, I don't know about rediscovering, really. I mean, I just feel that the whole era needed to be looked at with a slightly fresher, uh, more generous approach. And because glam, when glam is almost the word is used as a stick to beat the 70s. But if you think about it and the way this book is presented, so many big stars came from that period. Uh, you know, The Rod, Elton, Alice, uh, Bowie, Bolan, Ferry. Now there's half a dozen 
Yeah. Let yeah. it go away. And we, and we laugh about glam still often. It's just, you know, uh, oh, it's ABBA, it's um, village people or whatever, you know. It, 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 but it's not. It was a period really of a great acceleration of, of pop music. The sound of the glam records were quite different to the thinner sound of 60s records, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think it, the whole period needs to be, you know, I think treated with a little bit more care and respect, I would say. Respect is not a word that belongs anywhere near the concept <laughs> of glam, is it really? It's kind of very oh, modern sweet. Someday, <laughs> someday we'll get respect. Respect is the last thing we should ever give sweet. We they should just well, endure no. in our affections. But the I Irony. The irony, uh, David, is that in those days, all the prog acts would say, this glam stuff, it's going to last five minutes. Oh, yeah, now, in, yeah. the, in the 21st century, you put a glam record on next to a, one, you know, something by Gentle Giant, and what sounds fresh and new? What's, uh, what lives on? Absolutely. Glam, absolutely. Absolutely true. No doubt so, about that, that is one of the great ironies about this so-called, you know, yeah. Uh, phenomenon, a one-hit wonder kind of thing. It's uh, it's not. It's enduring. Well, it actually, and it, it applies right across the piece. Anything that's gone in the chart still sounds like something forty years later, because yeah. there's, there's just something about it. You know, it's got popular appeal. You know, yeah, with, yeah. In the way that I mean, there's a lovely quote. Uh, I don't know if I can quote it exactly in the book. I found of Pete Townsend at the end of '71. He was energized by the fact that Bolan, his old mate, uh, was having these hits, and he said he believed in the pop single again. You know, after doing Tommy and mm, yeah, yeah. and all this, he said, you know, it was condensed pop art condensed into you know three Absolutely. classic minutes. It was a better quote than that. Beautiful quote, but it was like the pop single is back. And all these well, that's artists. a really interesting point because you're saying that, uh, that at the beginning of all this, it was only housewives and, and very young teenagers who were buying singles, and actually older sing uh, teenagers were buying albums. That was the way the market had shifted. So there was this huge mm. gap for kind yeah. of 14, 15 year olds. We, we wanted singles and had nothing really to buy. So that was, yeah. that was perfect. They, they wanted singles and they wanted heroes. Yeah. yeah. To, people to and inspire it's them. How it, there were so many connections, I think, with. Uh, with with the other cultures, you know, cabaret and um, you know, uh, Clockwork Orange, the Clockwork Orange, various That's right. things that, that 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 people picked up visual um, signifiers from them, and it all it all yeah. bonded together. Yeah, absolutely. And then it started to change. Seventy three, seventy four. You had Brian Ferry in his lounge suit. You had the Great Gatsby yeah. on the film, and it started to get a bit smarter. And, yes. Um, yeah, uh, not so that's, that's, a, that's the wonderful thing that strikes me. I, I go back to what I said at the beginning. It's represented so well in pictures. Is it? It's not glamorous. Is it? <laughs> it looks. <laughs> it looks kind of tacky. It looks as if yeah. it's just been lashed together. You know, all of, all of this was done with no stylists. You know, there were no Winnie Bagos lined up around the block to get these looks. You know, people just put them together themselves, didn't they? That was they part did. of the charm. Well, June, June Bowler did dress Mark Bowler, I think, didn't she? Okay, think but she, she was not. But she was, that was pretty rare. There was nobody, there were no team of uh, stylists working with uh, with Dave Hill of Slade, were there? <laughs> <laughs> no, Dave, Dave Hill did it himself. Um, and he took the ideas back to Bert. He had some friends in Wolverhampton who said, do this for me, you know, make, yeah. make me, uh, which was great. Bolan was a stylist in a way that Zandra yeah. Rhodes, he was one of Zandra Rhodes' first, uh, you know, clients. And um, Chalita Secunda was a, a fashion journalist and she was the one who put the teardrops under his eyes. And but he, his friend Jeff Dexter said, you know, once he got famous, he did start to sort of lose that um, yeah. innate sense of style, you know. He, he kind of got a little bit lost, but Mark Bowler was one of these people, I think, that was almost a bit allergic to fame and allergic to the trappings of it, the drink and the drugs. He, you know, he had a half a pint and then he was kind of a bit all over the place. It went to his head, whereas I think Bowie did all that, but he had the strength, uh, the physical strength and perhaps yeah. the mental strength to cope with it better. Yeah. Bolan, Bolan was uh, more sensitive to it than that and yeah. went really off the rails. And, yeah. Well, look, well, look. Uh, it's been lovely talking to you, Mark. There's the book. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. When Superstars Rocked the World. Is it out now? Is it it's out, out in July, July the 7th, I think. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Never, too, never too early to pre-order. 